Well, good morning. You guys are killing it in the best possible way. Um, I have been watching the pastors, uh, our staff, we've been watching and uh, cheering for you guys because you're growing. This has been a phenomenal year. And um, just want you to know we see you, we love you. And man, I'm so excited about uh, the uh, progress that you're making. Jordan Peterson says that if you want to compare yourself to somebody, you compare yourself to who you were yesterday, not to who somebody else is today. And that's how we see you. That's how Jesus sees you. Who were you yesterday? Who were you three months ago? Who were you in January and who are you becoming? And uh, boy, I'm just so excited about it that I can hardly stand it. Last week, we talked about pride. We begin a series called Seven Things You Can Definitely Do to Totally Destroy Your Life. And uh, pride was the first one because it's based on the seven deadly sins. Now, we don't believe the seven deadly sins are sins that specifically send you to hell, um, as some you know denominations do, but it is a great list of things to sort of check ourselves with to make sure we're not exposed to examine ourselves and just make sure that we're living the life that Jesus wants us to live. So we don't take this list as anything except simply a list people put together that's a good benchmark for us to see our spiritual progress and to make sure that we're on the right track. Last week, we talked about pride. And I'll just be perfectly transparent because we're all friends. Um, last week was a hard one. And um, it was hard for me. It was hard for our staff. Uh, I think my wife, I think she didn't have any problem with it at all. She probably got an A, but I got a C minus, I think, as I graded myself. And I just stayed with these application points that I gave you last week. If you remember, uh, and we talked about pride. We talked about why do you have to win all the time? Are there times when you can not go first? Are there times when you can let somebody else take a turn? Are there times when you might choose to not even go at all? Why is it that we demand so much? Pride shows up in my life in so many different ways. One of the ways that I saw it show up this week was my impatience with people around me. Like my time was more important than theirs in some way, even people I care about with my listening. You need to talk faster. You need to get to the point because I'm trying to get, you know, I, I got nowhere to go. I just didn't want to be right there waiting for someone to get ready. When we weren't late, I just was impatient and I realized it was just pride. Why is my time more important? Why is my peace of mind more important? Why can't I just sit back and wait? And so God worked me over and I'm glad that we don't drop out if we fail the exam as this series goes on because I may not be able to be here this week. You probably wouldn't either, but that's not the point. The point is holding up the word of God, looking into it, not like a child looking into a mirror going, hey, I'm still here, but looking into the word to see the person we should be and allowing God to change us. That's the point. I recently, or not recently, a couple of years ago, had a conversation with a good friend who's a retired colonel from the Army National Guard and learned leadership at the highest levels that our military has to offer. And uh, I always love to ask questions about different cultures and leadership and stories so that I can learn because, you know, I have a lot to learn. And a couple of stories that he told me sort of stuck out in my mind. One of them not really related to this uh, subject, but uh, important. He said, hey, on deployment, he said, officers always eat last. And I said, why is that? Because they want to show their servanthood toward the others. He goes, no, because if you don't order enough food, you're the ones who don't get to eat. And uh, you remember to order enough food next time. I thought that was ingenious. And the second one that I remember really well is uh, he said that as he was going to accompany a, a higher ranking officer, as he was working up through his ranks in his career, uh, he showed up to the heliport, I guess that's what you call it, 15 minutes early and off went the helicopter and he wasn't in there even though he was 15 minutes early. So he looks over at the person who was left standing there and he said, what's the deal? I'm 15 early. And uh, they said something like this, 15 early is 15 late in the military. And this is the, the important part. A dollar never waits on a dime. And I thought about that and I thought, oh, that's a good tip to have if you're in the military. And then I thought, how does that translate to the Christian life? A dollar who's somebody more important, who's you know, in a higher rank than you, never waits on somebody who's in a lower rank. Very important to have that decorum when you're in a structured system like that. But Jesus came and washed his disciples' feet. And he said, if you want to be like me, then you go and you do like me and you serve. So the point I took from that is not that I want to be the dollar and everyone else the dime. It's that I want to see myself as the dime in all things and you as the dollar. 
And if I can do that and you can do that, then maybe we begin to kill pride because if we don't kill it, it destroys our relationships and it destroys our walk with God. Well, the one we're talking about today is equally as interesting and fun and potentially invasive. And it's called envy, jealousy. Nobody in here struggles with jealousy. Do you have the Insta? Do you have Facebook? Do you see everybody else's best version of their lives? Perfect vacations, perfect children, you know, perfect lives. Everything's perfect. Perfect homes, perfect possessions, edited. I mean, retouched, carefully promoted. Alternate versions of reality. All of us know what we're talking about. Drive down the street, see somebody else that has something. Well, I want that. Why don't I have it? Brings a sense of entitlement, brings a sense of jealousy, brings envy, and envy is dangerous. Let's define it as we get started. Envy is a noun, is a feeling of discontented or resentful longing aroused by someone else's possessions, qualities, or just dumb luck. As a verb, it's the desire to have a quality, possession, or other desirable, desirable attribute belonging to someone else. Here's Rick's definition. Counting somebody else's blessings, not your own. Counting somebody else's blessings and not celebrating those blessings, but you see the blessings they have in their life and you may offer a fake compliment or encouragement, a half-hearted sort of, hey, good job. But inside, down deep, you're like, mm, right? And I hate that in me and you should hate it in you. And because we hate it, we wanna kill it because it's one of the seven things that we can definitely do if we wanna to totally destroy our life, our marriage, our families, our friendships, our career, and most importantly, our walk with God. So we're gonna dive into that today and we're gonna work on killing that envy that can destroy and rot us from the inside out. In our city groups, they're completing over in the other side of the building here facility, this statement and did earlier already today. They completed this statement. If I was going to totally ruin your life or tell you how to ruin your life or tell my adult children how to ruin their lives, if I was gonna tell you how to totally ruin your life with envy, this is the way I would tell you to do it. Never be thankful with what you have. Always look at what everyone else has. Develop a sense of entitlement and demandingness to where you see God and think that he owes you and that you deserve something. Look at life with your glass half empty, not half full. Stand around and allow bitterness to take root and seethe under the surface and look for opportunities to celebrate when somebody else falls because it can elevate you in some sinful and diabolical way. None of us want that. Proverbs talks about it. Solomon, the wisdom literature, talks a lot about envy. And we've talked about Solomon. We've talked about Solomon was David's son who was the wisest man who ever lived. Yeah, biggest problem he had was women. And um, it wasn't that women were the problem, but that was his problem. But wisdom, he had lots of. For some reason, it didn't translate into his dating life. The seven deadly sins, pride, envy, gluttony, lust, anger, greed, and sloth. Proverbs 14.30 says, a heart at peace gives life to the body. I want us to settle here on this. Take a deep breath on this one and let's just let this one settle into our hearts. A heart at peace. Now I wanna tell you what that means. First of all, a heart at peace means that you are at peace with who you are and where you are in this moment. I'm at peace. That you're at peace with the circumstances in your life, even though you wish they were different in some cases. That you're at peace with other people in your life, beginning with those closest to you. Your spouse, if you're married, your significant other, your children, whether in your home or adults, your boyfriend, your girlfriend, friendships, working relationships, your church family. And most of all, I'm at peace with God. My conscience is clean. I'm in the moment. And this 
is where I'm supposed to be. Now, does that sound good? I mean, that to me, that's what I want. The Jews, when they greeted each other, they would greet each other and they would say peace to you because they wanted that for each other. And the proverb says, a heart at peace gives life to your body, but envy rots your bones. The imagery here is like a cancer that starts on the inside where you can't see it. And by the time you see it, it's too late and it turns you into dust. Well, I want peace. I want to kill envy and jealousy in my life. Who wants the bones to rot within you? Strong, strong words, powerful words. We have to ask ourselves as we cover each of these topics, is this me? Not is this Dan or is this Joy or is this your wife or your husband or your friend or your spouse or I need to send this message to someone else or I wish my kid could see this or my neighbor needs, I mean, is this you? Let the word of God land on you, look into it like a mirror and walk away convicted and convinced to change. Let's look at a few statements here and then we'll read a passage from Ecclesiastes. Envy is competing with people who don't even know that we're competing with them. Now, if there are people in your life who are these want-to-be sort of influencers who are trying to promote themselves in a way where you envy who they are and what they have, find different friends because the Bible talks a lot about who you surround yourself with and that's heading the wrong direction. But in most cases, envy or jealousy is competing with people who don't even know that we're competing with them. So how do you ever win? And this next statement's a little controversial. You may agree, you may disagree. I heard another pastor say this when I was listening to a sermon and it kind of stuck with me and I think I agree with it. If not, it's worth thinking about. Envy is such a present part or jealousy of who we are as people, so ingrained down deep in the sinful nature that we want dead, but seems to come back to life. This statement may resonate. Envy might not be a problem to be solved permanently, but an issue that must be managed. That gives me a little more encouragement because I can manage a problem even if it continues to pop up like whack-a-mole at Chuck E. Cheese. When you were a kid, you smack it and it pops up somewhere else. And then you smack it again, you whack-a-mole. But ideally it pops up, well, slower and slower and further and further between. Envy doesn't focus on counting your blessings, but focuses on counting your neighbor's blessings. And instead of celebrating with those blessings, looking at what they have and going, mm. now we never say it because that's, well, impolite, unwise, not friendly. But deep down inside, we're quick to offer some sort of false compliment, to pass on the gossip, to do whatever we can to knock it down a level so that we can feel like we're elevated. And you know what I'm talking about? And it's there and it needs to die. Solomon, once again, in Ecclesiastes 4, he says, And I saw that all toil and all achievement, overworking and over collecting, purchasing, accumulating, spring from one person's comparison or envy of another. That there's something driving us that's not Christ like or biblical, that there's not peace within. And this is the author, Solomon, the wisest person who ever lived, the author of Ecclesiastes, writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And he said, this is meaningless. It's like chasing after the wind. And then he says, fools just fold their hands and give up. Nobody's gonna do that. God gave you gifts to use. He gave you a work ethic. He gave you opportunity. We make the most we can with who we are and what we have. We're responsible for that. He's saying, don't just be lazy. Don't just be worthless but don't be driven by the things that are like chasing the wind, the things you can never catch, the things you think other people care about, but they don't. The things that separate you and drive you away from what's important, but we tell ourselves the lies that we have to. And man, this Solomon, he knew. He said, better is one handful that God gives you with what? Tranquility 
And the other word for that is peace that we've talked about that it's better to have one handful that's full of what God wants you to have than to have two handfuls with toil and chasing the wind. And he goes on. He said, again, I saw something meaningless under the sun. That word scares me, by the way. What's worse than living your entire life and then looking back on your life and realize that you got what you thought it was that you wanted, but that in the end, it was entirely meaningless. Nobody cares. That you thought you won, but you lost. He says, again, I saw something meaningless under the sun. There was a man all alone. He had neither son nor brother. Now, back in this culture, you couldn't leave possessions to women. It was wrong. It's just the way it was in this culture. Women couldn't inherit anything. Jesus had a totally different view of women. We do, I believe we've corrected that. It's just the way it was back in the Old Testament times. And what he's saying is this man's worked all his life and he doesn't even have a son or another male to give it to. But he said, yet there was no end to his toil. His eyes were not content with what he had, but he had to continue striving for more, which means that we cut out the things that are important and continue to pursue those things that we think are gonna fill the void as we get and work and compare and envy. For who am I working? Now, people will lie to themselves. I'm doing it for my family. Doing it for my kids. No, you're not. How many kids wake up in the morning and try to rush you out the door at 5 a.m. and say, Dad, don't come home until 10. I want you to work every daylight hour of the day. I want you to miss the important times in my life because I need you to have more money than we have right now. Show me a kid that says that. Well, I do it for my wife. If your wife wants to drive you out of the home into the point of no balance in life so that you accumulate, so that you frustrate, so that you work yourself into the ground. There's a problem with her because in a healthy relationship, nobody does that. And he says, why am I even doing this in the first place? What do I have to prove? Why am I depriving myself of the things that are really important? Investing in the kingdom, time, with my church family, time with my family, conversations that linger, an involvement and an investment in other people that can't be microwaved because relationships never happen in a hurry, but are allowed to cook over time. Why am I depriving myself of enjoyment? This too is meaningless. He said a miserable business, all right. Don't determine where you are by looking at where everybody else is. That's the end of the first half of my teaching time on envy. In a minute, we're gonna come back and I'm gonna take you all the way back, not as far as last week where we went to Genesis three, but all the way back to Genesis four. And we're gonna talk about the story of Cain and Abel and how envy and jealousy caused the first murder and their attitude toward worship and giving revealed their character and their commitment to God. Um, there's some things I don't like. Maybe you don't like them either. I asked my wife the other day, I said, Joy, tell me uh, the things I don't like. I need to make a list. And she goes, you don't like anything. And um, I said, but what irritates me? She said, everything. And I was like, well, maybe that's, maybe I'm a little too irritable, but there's some things I don't like. I already told you people that blow their grass in the street when they mow their grass drives me crazy. I told you that that's like one of my, my top pet peeves. When you sell something on marketplace and people just message you and ask if it's still available, it drives me absolutely batty. Um, when you're driving behind somebody and they're coming up to a light that is green, but they think it might turn red, so they start to slow down at the intersection to make you miss the light, drives me ab absolutely crazy. People who don't return text messages or emails, absolutely nuts. Someone who shakes your hand and it's wet with no explanation, <laughs> that skeeves me out like, I don't mind shaking hands, but when somebody shakes your hand and it's wet, 
and they just look at you like it's perfectly normal. I just want to know, hey, I'm sweating a little bit. I just grabbed a coffee. A lady one time had just put lotion on her hands and she didn't rub it in. And I was back in the back here shaking hands with people and she shook my hand. And I looked at her and I'm like, please just tell me. You know, she goes, oh, it's lotion. But the problem was everybody's hand after that that I shook, it was a <laughs> everyone. And I had to explain, oh, I'm sorry, the lady had lotion. I mean, some things drive you crazy. One of the things that drives me the most crazy in my life, I've, I've already said to you, is envy and jealousy. I hate it. I want it to die. I can't stand it when that bubbles up in my life. Don't want it. Don't want to be that guy. Don't want it anywhere near me. But yet I find that it continues to creep in. And so we're going to talk about how we kill it. But before we talk about how we kill it, let's look at the very first example of envy, the very first murder with the, um, at least two of the, probably the first humans beyond Adam and Eve, the kids. We don't know exactly the birth order. They had a bunch. Cain and Abel, found in Genesis chapter 4. We were in Genesis 3 last week talking about the first people, right? Adam and Eve. And uh, I didn't really mean to go Genesis 3, Genesis 4, and I'm not sure we're going to keep doing that through this series, but we're going to talk about the story of Cain and Abel because it's such an important story and there's so many firsts in this story. And it has in the beginning one of the most important and one of my favorite um, phrases in all of the Old Testament. And I want to read that to you now. So let's read this together. Adam made love to his wife. <laughs> that is not the one, the first one. <laughs> That's not the one I was talking about when I said my favorite. That's a really good one. That's a good one. Adam made love to his wife, Eve. I was not, that was not the one I was referring to. This is the one I was referring to here that comes next. And she became pregnant and gave birth to Cain. And she said, this one here is the important one. With the help of the Lord, I have brought forth a man. Now, this has very little to do with envy, but it has a lot to do with our perspective on human life and when it begins. Because what this literally said is from the very beginning, the first procreation, the first person born, that God was working and creating a human, a baby, along with Eve, from the very beginning, all the way through to the birth. So we can interpret whatever modern opinions or culture has to say and you're responsible for your own convictions, but there's very few pro-life statements that are any stronger than this statement at the very beginning of Genesis. And if you're wondering, the Bible continues that theme over and over again. So the Bible's clear. We just have to make sure we wanna line up with scripture and not something else, but that's just bonus. Um, with the help of the Lord, I have brought forth a man. Later, she gave birth to his brother, Abel, almost anticlimactic. And he had a brother. <laughs> it's always that next kid that never gets any respect, right? Now, Abel kept flocks. Um, so uh, he was a, you know, a shepherd and Cain worked the soil. He was a farmer. And in the course of time, it's weird to read from that side. I'm always over here. In the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. Now, we know that God had, had uh, told them that you should offer an offering to me that you should bring your offerings to me, that they should be your offerings, not out of your abundance, which means that it's not a sacrifice. I have a lot. It's the consumption assumption. Everything that God has given to me, I can consume and do what I want to with, and I'll tip God when I feel like it to make him happier, to impress other people. But that we don't just give out of our abundance, but we give according to our abundance in a way that's sacrificial, that's first, that's best. And so we see here a difference in a perspective toward worship and toward giving, which reveals the spiritual character of a person's heart. Not my words, God's words, right here from the pen of Moses in Genesis chapter four. And it still does that today. So we see that Abel also brought forth an offering. Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. He brought some out of his abundance. And Abel also brought an offering, the fat portions, the best portions from the best of his flock. He gave according to the way God had blessed him. God had blessed him so much that of course he gave sacrificially. Of course he gave to where it hurt. Of course he gave God his best. And the Lord looked with favor on Abel and on his offering which means that Abel had a heart that was right before God and his offering was acceptable to God, not because of the amount, but because of the sacrifice, because of the desire to give God best, because of the desire not to control, but to allow God to control. But on Cain and his offering, 
He did not look with favor. So Cain was very angry. What do you mean I have to give God my best? God, you gave your favor to my brother. What's so good about him? I'm going to do what I want with what I have. Oh, sure, I'll give you something. I'll tip you from time to time. Thanks for the crops. And God said, man, you are missing the point. Offering comes from the heart. So we show the Lord our heart by the way that we relate to him in worship and how we offer our lives and our resources and our time, time to him. And so the Bible says two very important things. One is upon Cain and Abel, he looked on them and their offering. And on Cain, he looked at them or him with disfavor. On Abel, he looked at him and his offering with favor, with pleasure. He was happy with him. But Cain was very angry and his face was downcast. It's sort of similar to the language that we see in Genesis 3 around the fall of Adam and Eve. But let's, let's move on to the next section here. The Lord then said to Cain, why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what's right, then things will be right between you and me. If you'll just do the right thing, why do you play games with me? Why do you play a shell game? Why are you wanting to manage your relationship with me? Why are you wanting to hide from me? Why are you wanting to control? If you'll just get right with me, things will be fine and you'll be blessed if you'll do that. But if you do not do what is right, sin is waiting for you at the door. Now, this is an imagery that was a Semitic sort of term where the Jews often used it to sort of refer to a demon that would be waiting to trap you or ensnare you but it certainly would be an opportunity for sin to get a hold of you and for it to become a character flaw, a weakness that doesn't just affect you, but passes on to the people closest to you and ultimately affects everyone, including the church family and including the community and world we try to reach. It's an infection that happens. And so God's saying, choose to get your heart right and things will be right with us, but you choose to continue your own way and sin is waiting to make you a slave. And so all of us, we cheer, we go, come on, Cain. Apologize, make it right. But he doubles down. This is the first, I mean, the first siblings, we think. The first offering, the first at least written about act of worship beyond Adam and Eve. First envy jealousy, one of the first massive examples of pride, and as we see, the first murder. Now, Cain said to his brother Abel, let's go out to the field. While they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel, and he killed him. Have you ever heard these uh, references to the Cain and Abel story? You ever heard about raising Cain? Anybody ever, you ever hear that saying? That's a chicken place too, I think, isn't it? I mean, but um, raising Cain or the mark of Cain, have you ever heard about that? It comes from this story. But have you ever heard, I'm not my brother's keeper or am I my brother's keeper? People say that. People say it, but I don't think they know what it means because we use it way out of context. Let me show you, okay? Then the Lord said to Cain, where is your brother Abel? Now God knew, but he was giving Cain a, a chance to, to make it right, to confess. He said, I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? Now, when someone says that today in our society, I don't know, am I my brother's keeper? You probably didn't murder your brother and bury him in the ground, right? We're saying it in a different way, but this is the way that it came out in the first place. Then the Lord said, what have you done? Listen, your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. Now you're under a curse and driven from the ground, which opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you work the ground now, it will no longer yield its crops for you and you will be a restless wanderer on the earth. And if you read the rest of the story, you see that Cain says, I can't be a restless wanderer here. The punishment is too strong. The other people will kill me. And if you're reading and paying attention, you'll text me, or email me and you'll say, who are the other people? I thought these were like the first kids. So I'm anticipating a question because you guys are digging deep. If these were like the first two kids, Adam and Eve were their parents, who are the other people? Back in the day, not today, families would marry each other 
and they had kids and procreated and there weren't the genetic complications we had. It was the way it was supposed to be then, but not the way it was supposed to be now. So we're talking about Adam and Eve's children, Cain and Abel's cousins, brothers, sisters. We know that, that Cain had a wife in Genesis 4, 17. It talks about Cain's wife, that God set him to wander the earth, that he put a mark on him. We don't know what the mark of Cain is. Now there is a religion that's still in existence today that has so misused the mark of Cain that they created a whole uh, theology, false theology that, that allowed people to justify slavery and terrible racism, not biblical, awful. You may have run into it. But the mark of Cain was a sign. We don't know. They thought God turned his skin black. Terrible injustice and misrepresentation of scripture. But there was a sign that was given to Cain. That was it. We don't know. On his forehead, on his arm, we don't know. That said, don't touch him. Your punishment's to wander the earth, never be satisfied, never be fulfilled, and deal with it. And you'll die an old man full of regret. Turmoil. No peace. Realizing that you got to the end and you failed. That was his punishment. Now I've gone through in your notes and I've sort of delineated each of the characters. I've given you some more information. It's on the PDF that you can get from your app. If you wanna see a little more, you can see what Cain means, what Abel means, and you can you know, read a little bit more into it. But I encourage you to take some deep dives into this story because it's phenomenal. But I don't have time to deep dive. What I do have time is to tell you that one of the reasons that Cain killed Abel was pure and simple jealousy. He looked at his brother and he saw that God had blessed him and he hated him for it and he wanted to kill him. Now it's an extreme case, but how far do we have to take it in extrapolation to the point where we flip open social media and look at somebody else's life and we see what looks like God's blessing, whether we think they deserve it or not, and begin to have the feelings in our heart that may not cause us to bury somebody three feet under the ground, I hope not, but still begin to commit that sin of envy and jealousy down deep in our soul. It's an extreme case, this first case, but man, what an important object lesson it is to learn. So let's wrap this up with a few concluding points. You, I, I always struggle with how to write this, whether, whether I use I, you, or we. I just want you to know, this is a we, these applications. I'm not saying you, even though I wrote you. I go back and forth and change it because something just doesn't sound right. This is us submitting ourselves to the authority of the word of God. We will never become the people we are created to be if we're constantly looking over our shoulder to see the kind of people that other people seem to be, never. In addition to that, we will never become the person that we are created to be if we are distracted by God's plan for somebody else. When we look at somebody else's husband who seems to be perfect, our wife, who seems to be the prototype of wives, or children who seem to be brilliant and accomplished, whose job seems to be stress-free, whose vacations always seem to be perfect, who God seems to use in mighty ways, who get to do things that I wanna do but I can't do. If we're constantly comparing, then what we're telling God is, you didn't make me enough. And I wanna promise you something that's not from me, it's from God's word. You are enough. In Psalm 118, I gave you a message on this not too long ago, and it's one of my favorites. I'd preach it about every three months if I could get away with it. It says, this is the day the Lord has made. I think it's Psalm 118, 17. It's somewhere right in the middle. This is the day the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. Now, I didn't leave it at that, right? Because this is the day is important. But I followed it up with three sort of um, divisions. And I said, when we say this to God, we have to say, I am the me that the Lord has made. 
and I will rejoice and I'll be glad in me. But I have things in me that I wish were different. I'd change them if I could. I mean, you may not see all my flaws, but I promise you I see them, or maybe not all, but a bunch. But I'm the way God created me. And so I have to be able to say to God, I don't envy your life because I wanna be the best me that I can be, not the best you. I'm the me that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in me. You have to say that about yourself. They are the they that the Lord has made. I'll rejoice and be glad in them. If they got it and it's really that perfect, good for them, I celebrate that. If they don't, I hope they find peace but you don't have to lose for me to feel like I win. And I don't have to always win so that I can make you lose. And then finally, it is the it that the Lord has made and I will rejoice and be glad in it. Some of the difficult things in life you've been through or are going through are your fault, my fault. And we deal with consequences. Some are the things that God led us to, which means that he wants us to be here and is giving us what we need to go through the difficulty to the other side to develop character. But somebody else's life is not better because it appears to be stress-free because it's theirs. It's not what God has given you. And the only way you find your purpose is if you stay in your lane because your lane is the only lane where you can affect the people who are around you. The rest is just a hypocritical act. Well, the third part to that, thank you, Jared, for putting that up there, is you'll never become the person you're created to be if you're looking for the approval of somebody else. Maybe it was a parent, maybe a boss, maybe one of your kids who seems to have given approval to somebody except for you. And it began to rot you from the inside out as you were jealous and envious. And sometimes these people aren't even alive anymore. If we're honest, sometimes that's the reason that we're driven for so much accumulation and so much stress, workaholism, lack of balance, because we're trying to win the approval of somebody who either can't because they're dead or won't because there's something wrong with them, give us some approval that we're jealous of that perhaps they've given to a sibling or somebody else. Well, let's wrap it up. If you wanna compare yourself to somebody, compare yourself to the person you were yesterday and not to who someone else seems to be today. Now I compare myself to myself yesterday in January, in March, as we've been working through this year of spiritual growth and transformation. And when we started today, I told you, I see you and I'm proud of you because you're winning. Now, by you winning, it doesn't mean somebody else is losing. It means we are winning the war of transformation because you're growing. And I promised you, if you come consistently, if you give more of your heart to the Lord and you lean in, God will take you on a journey this year where when you get to December, you are going to be a different person. And so many of you are as evidenced by our baptisms over and over and over as we have scheduled out for the next six weeks or so. But we compare ourselves to Jesus because that keeps us humble, not to you. I might beat you in certain things, you might beat me. But when I compare myself to Jesus, that keeps me humble. And when I compare myself to who I used to be, it keeps me hopeful. And when I compare you to the person you used to be, it keeps me helpful. And that's the secret. So here's the anecdote to envy. This is it. You wanna kill it? This is how you kill it. Jealousy, gonna tell you how to kill it. This is it, gratitude. You can choose to look at your life as a glass half empty. Opportunities lost, mistakes made, filled with regret, bitterness, anger, entitlement. I deserve more, I need more, they have more and it will rot your bones or your glass is half full and being filled as you're being transformed, becoming the person God has in mind in the first place. There was a song I heard growing up. 
Some of the songs growing up were awful. I mean, I grew up in church. I was like a negative nine month kid in church. My mom pregnant, I was in church with her. Um, as soon as I was born, whenever the doctors back then, they'd let you go to church, I was in church. I was so churchy, I went to church on Sunday morning to Sunday school, then I went back again to worship. Then I had to go back again on Sunday night. Then I went on Wednesday. I was in so church so much, I had no time to do anything else. And I'm thankful that we have more balance in our life right now, that we can focus our time when we're together, but we can go and live our testimony when we're not. But we sang songs and we sang old school songs and some of the songs were excruciating and some of them were awesome. They were anthems to life. And I remember some of those songs. So if you're not churchy like me, if you didn't grow up, you know, in church, you may think this is the weirdest thing in the world. And we can be weird from time to time. We have our own songs after all. But this was a song that I learned back when I was a kid. And the song is simple. It says, count your blessings. Anybody else remember that song? Anybody? Count your blessings. Name them one by one. Count your many blessings, see what God has done. You wanna kill envy, friends, you sing this song and you sing it every day and you mean it with sincerity and clarity and you will kill envy in your life.